Give me land, land to own, land unbeholden to any tyrant, land that will be free. Give me land, for I am starving. Give me land that my children may not die. Sell it to me. Sell it to me at a fair price, as one freeman sells to another, and not as a usurer sells to a slave. I am poor, but I will pay it. I will work, work, until I fall with weariness for my privilege, for my inalienable right to be free. Good evening. I am Raul Manglapus. Join me in faith in the Filipino. Raul Sevilla Manglapus was an orator, a scholar, a teacher, a diplomat, a senator, a composer, a musician, a linguist, a writer a freedom fighter, a statesman in exile, a politician who left public office with his character undiminished and his reputation untarnished by corruption, a businessman, a humanist, an idealist, a visionary, and a man, some have said, was the greatest president the Philippines never had. He was born in Manila on October 20, 1918, the only child of Valentin Manglapus from Tagudin, Ilocosur, and Justina Sevilla from Malabon, Rizal. His father was a lawyer and the publisher of a national weekly magazine in Spanish and Ilocano called El Norte. His mother was an enterprising woman whose business ventures included a shoe store in Binondo, and a gas station on Rizal Avenue. Manglapus had a patrician upbringing and was a pampered child, not surprising after his mother, already in her 40s, had suffered three previous miscarriages. He was not only fluent in Spanish, English, and different dialects, but he could play the piano without learning how to read a single musical note. He attributed these skills to a highly developed sense of hearing, perhaps to compensate for having been born practically blind in one eye. There was not much chance for my father to pass on any deep-seated values to me, except that in his career he displayed certain qualities that were of influence in my later life. He was not elected, so his term of office was subject to the whims of the executive and the leadership in the House of Representatives and the Senate. One day soon after my father was appointed, the Quezon administration, through Governor Harrison, submitted a bill in Congress, which was then known as the Divorce Act. My father found it difficult to vote, so he was forced to resign, and that was an early lesson in principle that I learned from my father's career. He taught me by his own actions how to act by principle in politics. My mother had a much deeper influence on me. She was a very articulate person. She was very strict, she had to be, because she was not only left alone to deal with me, but also the family. My father died when I was only 19. It was my mother who took care of me, not only physically, but also economically. Fortunately, my mother came from a family with its own resources. Raul Manglapus.
From his family, Manglapus learned the values of hard work, strength of character, and public service. His father served as the Mountain Province representative to the First National Assembly in 1916, and his uncle, Francisco Sevilla, was the governor of Rizal Province from 1931 to 1937. But it was the Jesuits at the Ateneo College who instilled in him the meaning of service to others. I think the way that we used to formulate it at the time of Raul is it was they used to speak about sapientia, eloquentia, very much focused on learning, solid learning, and the ability to express it well. So uh, a lot of what uh, people would quote about Raul is his command of language, you know, uh, eloquence and great command of language. But the other thing that has been very important in uh, Jesuit education is the desire to form leaders uh, and to form leaders for the common good. The purpose of Jesuit schools from the very beginning was to really uh, form, uh, in the beginning, young men, eventually young men and women, who would make a difference for their societies. Uh, maybe the best way to express it in Raul Manglapus's time uh, was the work that he and other uh, young Athenians did in their time with what they called the Bellarmine Evidence Guild. It was something started by a Jesuit father, Mulry, and it was his effort to help articulate a Catholic uh, approach to the social problems of the time. In those days, I had done some song composing of my own, which was part of the romance of my younger days. I decided to write a song for the Ateneo. And since the mascot was the Blue Eagle, I decided to write a song about the Blue Eagle. 1939 was a kind of historical landmark year for me, both in academics, in songwriting, and in speech writing. I graduated summa cum laude. My song was picked as the official school song, and I delivered the speech, Land of Bondage, Land of the Free. My tutors then were Father Mulry and Father De La Costa. They gave me advice on the style and substance of the speech. The substance of the speech reflects the passion for social justice. When Raoul graduated from the Ateneo, the editors of the yearbook printed below his picture the well-known quotation, Raul Manglapus, the man who walked with kings but never lost the common touch. Did they realize they were uttering a prophecy? Father Miguel Bernat. Raul was very much focused uh, on service to the nation, uh, he, 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 so much of his life was dedicated to public service, whether it's uh, running for national office as a senator, a failed bid at higher levels, uh, but, uh, and then of course uh, uh, serving under cabinet, under President Corey, uh, but all his life was really dedicated to, to first uh, service in that area. But beyond that, uh, if you listen to his speeches, it, it was always a plea uh, to leaders and to the Filipino nation to aim for the ideals of democracy, the ideals of caring for the poor, and the ideals of creating greater equality in our country. So uh, he, was, he was very focused on the nation. The outbreak of the Second World War brought an end to the idyllic world of Manglapus' youth. I arrived in Fort Santiago, 
the process of torture began. They were after information on how I distributed the material I wrote, and they wanted information on who worked on the rest of the material, particularly the Tagalog portion. When I refused to give them the information, they beat me up severely, my back, my face. They were using clubs and sticks. They hit me in every part of my body. They asked me to kneel on the cement floor in very uncomfortable positions. This went on during the whole course of the day. They would just pull us out of the cell and then bring us back and pull us out again. When they saw that they were not getting any information at that time, they would put us back in the cell. The torture went on for days and days. I would say maybe close to a month. They wanted to build a theory that the whole propaganda organization was being run from the Ateneo by the Jesuit fathers. They were trying to build this theory, and since it was not true, we denied it. The whole problem was not only the survival of the torture, but the survival of the ordeal of imprisonment, which was just taking forever. So under that, we resorted to prayer. When we were moved from Fort Santiago to Belibid, where they give us uniforms, some of our fellow prisoners very cleverly made rosaries out of yarn that they drew from the uniforms. Even if it was not allowed, we started to pray the rosary, if possible in groups, but if not, just individually. Sometime in 1942, during the Japanese occupation, a businessman of foreign nationality came to the Ateneo at Padre Fara and asked to be instructed in the faith. He said he wanted to become a Catholic. Asked what prompted such a decision, he said he had made it in a Japanese prison. He had been arrested by the Japanese, imprisoned in Fort Santiago and placed in a foul cell with many other prisoners. One of them, a young man named Raul Manglapus, would lead a rosary every night, and the other prisoners joined in the prayers. That young man's faith, courage, and cheerfulness, the businessman said, helped to keep up their spirits and kept them from giving way to despair. Father Miguel Bernat. As early as 1941, Manglapus was already active in politics as a youth leader. After the liberation of Manila in 1945, he joined the Malacanang Press Corps and was sent to Tokyo as a war correspondent. He was one of only two Filipinos who witnessed Japan's surrender aboard the USS Missouri. In 1953, he became the campaign manager of the Magsaysay for President movement and composed the best political jingle in Philippine politics, Mambo Magsaysay. When Magsaysay was elected, Manglapu served as his Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, and at Magsaysay's untimely death, he became the acting secretary, the youngest ever to fill the post. In 1961, he won a seat in the Senate garnering the highest number of votes. Raul became more than just an articulator of an independent or Asian, for Asian foreign policy, but he identified himself with very important Philippine social issues like the emancipation of the Filipino peasants from, from exploitation and uh, bondage. Of, ten, of tenancy. In one of the Senate debates on land reform, Manglapus argued why tenancy is evil. Because it is paternalism in its most insidious form, he said. A kind, benevolent landlord cannot best treat his tenant as a child, making his decisions for him. 
not only those decisions that have to do with planting, but even those that have to do with the tenant's own life and being. This is the way sharecropping tenancy has worked all over the world. The tenant's mind persists in childlike innocence, uncreative, unproductive, crushed by the overpowering paternalism of the system. We wanted to put down a program of agrarian reform, you know, step by step, by step, you know. And that is why he asked Luis Tarok and also Bonnie Gilliego to join. And uh, we, we hammered out qu quite a very, very good program, really, you know, step by step what to do. Because at that time, Congress, Congress was uh, lorded over by, by the landholding elite. You know, and and uh, even with his great popularity, uh, Magsaysay couldn't push through his sweeping land reform program. You know? So we felt that it was very necessary to support such a program with with a massive political organization and political action. You know? We are very much into land reform, but I must say that I'm very dissatisfied with much land reform because when they gave the land, they did not give the support services. So the farmers became worse off, agricultural productivity went down, and the landlords were left with almost nothing. So we believe in land reform, but we think the land reform should be transformed into the land reform that old Manglapos wanted. The land reform he wanted was for the farmer to get the land, but to become better off. And therefore, if you want to follow Marol Manglapos' view, you must not measure the land that was given only. You must measure how it has benefited the farmers. And if there's no support services, it has made their lives worse. And it is unfair. That's why we believe in Roman Rapus' type of land reform. And we must do that now. As a political leader, Manglapus had three great passions. Freedom, social justice, and the upliftment of the Filipino people to their highest potential. He worked tirelessly for land reform and decentralization in the Senate. In his drive to reform the political system and compel political parties to be based on well-defined platforms, he founded the Christian Social Movement, a political movement influenced by the social teachings of the Catholic Church. With his vision to lead the Philippines to greatness, he attracted youth leaders in the 1960s who rallied behind the ideals he advocated. The first contact I had with Roland Manglapos is through print. He had this beautiful uh, speech, Land of Bondage, Land of the Free, where he talked about how the farmer should till his own land. That's how I got to meet him through his speech. I my in, uh, involvement with the uh, the great Raul Manglapos actually started in 1965, uh, and this was the time when he ran for president. I then was then a youth volunteer for the, the campaign, and then that, that, that group actually evolved into the uh, Young Christian Socialist of the Philippines uh, two years after. I joined uh, the Young Christian Socialist of the Philippines in 1968 and uh, became a uh, the successor secretary general of the youth group in 1970. And, uh, well, uh, my exposure with Raul is that basically he was challenging the young uh, really to go out and be counted and do something. He was one of the greatest influences in my life because of him, I chose to devote a lot of my time to helping farmers and fisher folk. He provided hope. He provided a new spirit. He uh, was a perfect gentleman, an Athenian of the highest order, summa cum laude. He had all the credentials. Uh, he had the charisma of uh, the gift of being able to communicate his ideas very, very well. That was one of his most perfect weapons, grassroots leadership on the ground. Uh, but then ideas uh, germinate that way. They come by way of uh, things that are untouchable, but things that you can believe in based on your faith. And uh, he started that. Our population is multiplying. Our resources continue largely untapped. Wealth is being produced, but its fruits go to an even smaller portion of the population. 
There are rumblings of a hook resurgence, and alarms have been sounded over the infiltration of labor and students. What is our response? Imprisoned in this, elect me first, I'll think of ideology later, and I'm less corrupt than thou, political system. All we can think of is to let loose the congressional investigators and prepare to pin the label of un-Filipino on anyone who, seeing no future in our system, would explore other possibilities for a society based on social justice. Instead of offering our young, our peasants, our workers, our underprivileged, a choice of fresh directions and a vision of a better tomorrow, balanced, if you will, on the alternating but identifiable forces of liberal socialism and conservatism as other modern democracies have succeeded in achieving, we have persisted in pragmatic case-to-case -case politics, which our society can ill afford, but which is the only kind which our imprisonment will allow. And will one blame these young, these peasants, these workers, these underprivileged, if failing to see this choice, this direction, this vision, they turn to the promise, however utopian, of those who would raise the banner of social class, steer hate, and sow subversion. There were three issues that were uh, preoccupied him. One was land reform, because he thought that the concentration of land, not in the hands of the actual farmers, but in the hands of absentee landlords, was one of the causes for the poverty in the Philippines. The other, another was uh, decentralization, which meant giving local government units more powers of taxation, of uh, management, of uh, political power. And the third was investments. He was the champion of the barrio. He pushed for the barrio. No? He pushed for self-determination on that level. The politicians felt threatened enough by all this to charge him with uh, overspending for elections. And remember that uh, he was uh, ultimately deprived of his Senate seat. Uh, I consider this as a, as a manifestation of uh, the resistance of the establishment to his ideas. Uh, if his ideas were even up to now ahead of his time, although uh, some progress has been made in terms of local autonomy, the freedom of enterprise, the uh, uh, land reform, some progress has been made, but still it's not enough to lift uh, our people out of their poverty. Ever the nonconformist, Manglapus launched his candidacy for president in the 1965 elections. In doing so, he challenged the entrenched political machineries of the two major parties, the Liberal Party, led by the incumbent Diosdado Macapagal, and the Nationalista Party of Ferdinand Marcos. His party was appropriately called the Party for Philippine Progress. I was the national chairman for youth training committee. We went out on our own. We painted the, you know, the triangular symbol of the of uh, the Party for Philippine Progress, the PPP. We were twitted as chaotic. We didn't care. We wanted to make a difference, and I guess that's the lesson for many that you have to really dare. And that is what Raul Manglapus was. He was daring. I was one of his workers campaigning for all. In 65, when uh, he ran for president against Marcos and Macapagal, uh, we knew we were not going to win. Still, we, the Ateneo students group, who were his volunteers, we really uh, pushed for him. And that was the time when I met him personally, see, the first time. It was a very auspicious beginning when I met him because he approached me. I was introduced to him as one of the volunteers and he said, uh, Lorenzana, 
said one that isn't. We must be related. See, from that then I saw that I wrote. From that then I was his for life. Between 65 and 67, during which time these reformists had to think out their strategy all over again with respect to the political situation in the Philippines. Their answer was the Christian social movement. What is curious is that in 1967, another movement was also launched. And this movement, the movement for the advancement of nationalism, was launched by Jose Maria Sison. I was a part of that Juma Sison organization. I got my exposure from Juma Sison himself when I came back from the U.S. as an exchange student. Uh, but when I transferred to UST, I got exposed to the group of Raul Monglapos. And uh, it was closer to my upbringing, you know. We were brought up in a very uh, conservative and religious uh, environment. And Raul was talking about uh, a Christian ideology. He saw that uh, the Christian social movement was going to draw away from him many of the young people, which in fact it did. Because those who did not believe in violence, but in moderate changes, moved towards the Christian social movement. And this is where I come in, you know. This is where my little outfit comes in, Solidaridad. You know. This is where the char charges that we, Raul, and the rest were CIA France, you know. That's a lot of bullshit. I'm sorry, huh? You know. Um, all, all, all these were concoctions of the communist left. The communists were very, very clever in co-opting the nationalist movement, you know. The words of uh, Father Pacific Ortiz, who was then the uh, president of the Ateneo, was the very apt articulation of the social conditions at that time, that the Philippines was sitting on a social volcano. The KM, if you will, or the party of, uh, of Jose Maria Sison was kind of romantic for those who want to go out in the boonies. And of course, they were very pragmatic. They were also engaged in total warfare. The threat of uh, communism was exaggerated. If you look at the numbers of the Communist Party at the time, there were fewer, there were few of them, a few hundreds of them. They were not an armed threat that Taruk was in 48. It was magnified and it was used by Marcos to justify the suppression of civil liberties to entrench himself so that it would, ju that it would justify his seizure of power because Marcos, Marcos wanted to extend his term for the second time. He needed an excuse to extend his, his term and he needed a good one. And so a lot of incidents were provoked, bombings in Manila, to uh, dramatize the alleged threat of the uh, Communist Party. Marcos and Raul were two different individuals. Marcos was devious. Raul was sort of uh, had a person whom people could easily trust. They were both articulate, but they were articulating different kinds of political ideas. Raul was uh, more on reform and uh, honest governance. I've never known him to have accepted any bribes, be influenced by people with, with private agenda. The form of leadership that he exercised for us was a very ideal form of leadership. To dream the impossible dream. And that is what we are doing. What Marcus did was to, to steal away from us our future, my generation. He took away our future. He took away our hope, which was the Constitution of 1972. We fought for a constitutional convention. And Marcos, for his own benefit, did not oppose it. So the Constitutional Convention took place in 1971.
In that convention, several of the ideas came into uh, the vocabulary of political affairs. Ownership of property carries with it a social responsibility. There was need to break up a two-party system that is entrenched in the Constitution and allow other political parties to emerge. The issue of autonomy had to be addressed. And uh, the form of government had to be revised. In spite of any result of any constitutional convention, I have no intention of running for a third term. Don't you think that two terms is enough for any man? The challenge in the constitutional convention was to make it truly independent and to come out with real reforms. We tried to get Rule as president. We lost. And they tried to get us who were supporting him. I was called by Malacanang twice. I was called by the Speaker of the House once and by others. It's not easy when you get out there before the, in the corridors of power when the president is trying to charm you or intimidate you or the Speaker of the House taking you to a hotel and you're waiting there as a bottle of scotch in the middle and he comes in and he says, he demands that I withdraw my name from the bad Marcos proposition. Marcos left an enormous legacy, the most important of which was that he destroyed, he demolished Philippine democracy by, by uh, declaring martial law. I have uh, proclaimed martial law in accordance with the powers vested in the president by the Constitution of the Philippines. When martial law was declared, our leaders were, of course, incarcerated. Fortunately, Raul escaped it by just a few hours before martial law was declared. His very act of uh, declaring martial law and uh, assuming direct control of the armed forces as the commander-in-chief, was uh, possible only during a martial law situation. The armed forces of the Philippines, including uh, what is now the PNP, Philippine National Police, but which used to be a part of the armed forces, called the Philippine Constabulary and the Integrated National Police, uh, is a group of truly professional Filipinos professional public servants in uniform. What uh, we knew was correct was duty, honor, and country. And to obey only the legal orders of our superiors. Obviously, with martial law, uh, this uh, created a new situation for all of us who were in uniform. On many occasions, uh, in my case, for instance, as a commander, as chief of the Philippine Constabulary and Integrated National Police, uh, there was a very, very fine line uh, between uh, doing what is right in our own consciences according to the law or uh, complying with the orders of the commander-in-chief. Many of the members of the young Christian socialists, of the Christian, I mean, basically among the young, ended up as top cadre of the underground movement. Uh, well, we, for us, we didn't really join the underground movement, but since we're identified with Raul Manglapos, me, I, I, I was arrested. Uh, I've been, I experienced uh, 
altogether at two years of, of being in prison, not only once, but three times. Those are the things that I have experienced. But you know, those are the things, you, you stand up for something you believe in, and we said that we're not communist. We are, uh, but anything, either you're anti-communist or communist, as long as the word of communist is there, you get arrested in those days. And it was a tough one. But of course, uh, all of those are part of history. It will not last long. Well, you survive it. Like that when you, mm. just the word reform, mm. when you advocate reform, mm. you'd be considered a subversive. Yes, yeah, subversive. You know? mm. And uh, of course, I, I'd say, uh, my, my, in retrospect, my, 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 my impression now is, uh, we were really on the verge of, verge of adapting because that was one of the things that made us, mm. made us distinct from the, uh, from the National Democratic Movement mm. or from the uh, Communist Party of the Philippines was our denial of armed struggle. Arm struggle. But even then, even then, I think we were sort of considering that option. Mm. While being Christians or Christian Democrats, we were, were sort of, at a certain point, we were open to that option. We even had our training. Uh, preparing for uh, preparing it, for it uh, which found expression sooner or later in the in several movements, you know, light the fire, uh, April six, uh, and all those movements afterwards. In 1976, a number of the Christian social movement uh, members could no longer wait. Nene Pimentel was this particular one. And they started the PDP in Cagayan de Oro, which is really an offshoot of the Christian Social Movement. Raul, in the meantime, had started the Movement for Free Philippines in the United States. While in exile, Manglapu started the overseas propaganda movement against the dictatorship. Not unlike what Filipino patriots had done in Madrid, during their struggle for reforms under Spanish rule. We crafted the declarations of the movement for a free repentance to restore constitutional democracy. And this was a lawless presidency, we pointed out. Uh, it was a seizure of power, a palace coup, and therefore uh, the people must be heard. We were going to rally the Filipino-American community and the Filipino-American community would seek to influence public opinion in the United States because we knew that the uh, American government was propping up Marcos, supporting the dictatorship. There were liberals in the American community, especially in the American Congress, that did not agree with this American policy of cuddling this, this, uh, this, uh, this form of government, especially on very promising democracy like ours. So we decided that we should focus our campaign in shaping American policy in the U.S. Congress itself. And we strengthened the chapter in Washington where Rule was already staying. When I got to Washington, the first thing I did was call up the people that I know to, to give me Raul's telephone and I called him up, you know. And he was very, very happy, you know, because he said, Alamo Frankie, so many of my friends come here, they don't even bother to call me. But they, they, because they were afraid, you know. Because uh, that, that their meeting with him would jeopardize them when they come back. See, so, but what have I to lose, this, this bookshop? <laughs> well, Raul was our father symbol. Uh, to most of us, he was our hero. So we kept the spirit of opposition, not only among the Filipino community, but in the whole American uh, uh, community. solitary confinement for more than seven years, I had nobody to talk to. The only thing that sustained me through those hours was the thought that in the United States there were a handful of men and women still carrying the torch of freedom. Those were indeed the sustaining hope that kept us alive. And for the last eight years, the movement for the free Philippines has kept that flame alive. And because you kept it alive today, that flame is a bush fire that will soon engulf this nation in the restoration for our freedom. This 
is ABC News Nightline. President Marcos uh, is, uh, has been for a long time now no longer part of the solution in the Philippines. He is the problem. Uh, he has to be removed uh, from office <coughs> and re be replaced by a transition government. Uh, and uh, the process has to take place beyond uh, what is now being foisted upon us, namely uh, the electoral process. I realize that Senator Laurel is uh, an outstanding candidate for president, and I think he is making a contribution uh, by uh, presenting himself as a candidate. But I think he realizes, too, that uh, no dictator in uh, history has ever allowed himself to lose power by elections. All right, no, the, the, the communist threat is something that is waved around whenever people in power want to stay in power. But sometimes it is a real threat. In the Philippines, it may be a real threat. To what degree? Well, let me put it this way, Ted. Uh, next week, we shall see the first of what I think will be a series of formal defections on high level from the armed forces of the Philippines. Officers who have uh, given up uh, trying to defend uh, the government because it is not a credible government. The communist threat is growing, not because the armed forces of the Philippines lack the bullets and the weapons with which to fight uh, the insurgents, but because the people believe, are beginning to believe more in the insurgents than in the army, but, and because the army is, is trying to defend an indefensible an incredible government. Now, that's an extraordinary kind of statement to make. You, you either know what you're talking about, and I assume you wouldn't say it if you didn't, so you assume that there are going to be defections. Defections yes. to whom? To the communists? Well, no. No, defections away from uh, Marcos and uh, into the democratic movement. In February 1986, I was the number two man in the armed forces of the Philippines as the vice chief of staff next to the chief of staff, who was uh, General Fabian Baer. Now, talking about the uh, transformation of uh, yours truly, as well as parts of the armed forces, and the Philippine Constabulary Integrated National Police, uh, I would like to uh, say for the record that uh, it wasn't a sudden change, but it was a change that steadily uh, develop and then eventually burst out into open rebellion. It's not just opposition. We were willing to fight it out to the death during the third week of February 1986 because in the minds of many of us commanders at that time as well as young lieutenants in the field. Uh, enough was enough. It was time to uh, effect regime change to restore our democracy. It was Filipino opposition leader Raul Manglapas who returned from exile. Manglapas lived in the U.S. since Marcos declared martial law in 1972. There is a new goddess in the pantheon of freedom, and the name of that goddess is Corazon Aquino. Manglapu set a global outlook in his fight for democracy. During his years in exile, he co founded Democracy International, an organization made up of political dissidents against dictatorships from the left and the right. While serving as the Foreign Secretary under President Aquino, he conceptualized the formation of the Movement for Newly Restored Democracies. This movement has grown from 13 original member countries to over 150, and it is now an attached agency of the United Nations. Raul Manglapos and I and Cory and so many others, even if they had a military background like I did, are of the sincere belief that it is the strengthening of our political institutions as well as the uh, improvement, call it the refinement of our still faulty Philippine democracy that uh, should be the right way. We must still go through the democratic 
Christian Muslim way to get things done in our country. In 1972, prior to the declaration of martial law, Raul Manglapus and Michael Mastura, as delegates to the Constitutional Convention, drafted a Muslim Christian manifesto, which embodied the fundamental ideals of a true democracy and laid down a dynamic basis for Filipino Muslim Christian cooperation. Once Raul Manglapus returned, the first thing he did was to get in touch with me and pick up this uh, Manglapus Mastura Manifesto. And we did uh, relaunch it when he was Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. But this particular document is, is really an, an historic document because it shows that uh, Christians and Muslims can actually be together under one political agenda. Without necessarily being very, very ideological, uh, right here and now, but the Bangsamoro people, the Muslims in the Philippines have uh, become more ideological than before. But it does not mean that we have parted ways. In fact, the challenge is how the Christians themselves can meet this uh, challenge of, uh, let us say, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front using Islam as an ideology, an Islamic movement, uh, as a projection of their aspiration, as a, a projection of their uh, image, and as a projection of their vision of a future uh, uh, community and the status that they will uh, uh, enjoy. It's something that it should be looked at uh, as a political, a political philosophy again so that we, we can again bring the moderate elements of, of the Muslim, uh, our Muslim brothers, together with the mainstream Christian community, uh, the, the social teaching of the church and the social teaching of, of the Muslim uh, faith, I think can be together in one umbrella because I think that there are a lot of similarities more than there are differences, uh, which can basically put this country forward. Do political parties articulate their political philosophies? Now tell me, which political parties have articulated their political philosophy? At the moment, I only see two. One is the moribund Communist Party, which is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And the other is the political philosophy of Christian democracy. What I learned while working from, with him was uh, a realization of uh, the kinds of problems that this country had and has and uh, what is needed to change things around. For, for example, he was, he was talking about and remember the old liberal nationalista parties. And he considered them with great insight as two factions of the same party. And what he was saying was that there's no alternative in politics to this one party. One party because they represented the same things, the interests of the landowners, the, land, the interests of the rich. And uh, what he wanted was to, to have a real two-party system that let the conservatives uh, espouse the interests of the rich if they want, but let there be an alternative who would, in, in effect, represent the interests of the poor. 20 years ago, he talked to the Filipino people and advanced the thesis that there must be a new Filipino. He advanced the thesis that the Philippines today must now adopt a Christian socialist trend. That the privileges of the oligarchy of the past 
she had become science of history, and we, that we should now start sharing the wealth of our people among the greatest number. At that time, he was a lonely voice in the wilderness. And I must confess, at that time when I was part of a major political party, we actually poo pooed his ideas. Luckily for this man, this prophet, I think he will still live to see the day when all of his early urgings and all of his early pleas and plans for our people will come to fruition. The person who is advocating something should articulate what his political philosophy is. Uh, why can he not do it? What is keeping him from saying, I stand uh, on a political philosophy of the following, uh, on the following ideas? Or are you saying, they say, oh, I will run simply because people like me and I... Uh, that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole problem. Uh, political parties must articulate their political philosophy. The Christian Social Movement, launched in 1967, evolved into the National Union of Christian Democrats in 1984, founded by Avelio Javier and Amado Lagdameo. In 1989, it merged with the United Muslim Democrats of the Philippines, led by Ambassador Sanchez Ali. In 1992, they merged once more, this time with the Lakas Tao of Fidel Ramos. The party is now known as Lakas CMD. We introduced the Christian and Muslim democracy in the Philippines. And Raul Manglapus was the father of Christian democracy in the Philippines. Let me say a little something about Christian democracy. It is not a new idea here. It has been in Europe even before the Second World War. While Raoul was in exile, he was invited by the CDI, Christian Democrat International, to be an officer, and he joined CDI. They decided to change the name to Centrist Democrat International to reflect uh, the, the desire to expand in other countries in the world that are not predominantly Christian. But the values of, of Christian democracy basically is, is, is uh, humanism and the dignity of the person, which is paramount in, in all the political ideas that they, they push forward. One of the uh, important components of uh, Christian democracy, first people empowerment, and then uh, what is called in the uh, uh, she the ideology as subsidiarity, but that is not too well understood by our people. I define that in this way. We must have subsidiarity, but it is like this. It is five letter D's of governance, I said. First of all, devolution. This means do not acquire, do not uh, monopolize all government power here at Malacanang. No, you devolve, you delegate. Second was decentralization. Not everything should be decided here in Manila. Not all the opportunities for uh, economic progress should be absorbed here in Metro Manila. No, we decentralize that to all the communities. And I did that by... Uh, establishing, again, in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity uh, espoused by Raul Manglapos by creating a Philippine Economic Zone Authority, which had the power to establish special economic zones down below. Now, what is the next D? This is deregulation. Government should get out of the functions and the businesses that rightfully belong to the private sector, and which the private sector can do better anyway. Now, the fourth D is democratization of opportunity. Rich or poor, whether you are from the extreme south, meaning Tawi-Tawi or uh, Metro Manila, the most prosperous area, Equal opportunity must be given to this young man, to this young lady, as they start life. Development of a sustainable kind. Meaning, 
uh, Mother Earth, Planet Earth has only so much. It's a finite amount. It's a limited amount. Ultimately, all political ideas translate into economic issues. A centrist position in economic terms simply means that you recognize the market forces of supply and demand. You do not go all out for a laissez-faire theory, but you allow the forces of supply and demand to dictate the prices in the market. You know, however, that not everybody in society will be able to sustain the stiff market forces that may play on that society. And so you move also a little to the social side of the economy. We have been too long afflicted with a masochistic vice of glorifying poverty, as if to be poor were a virtue. For instance, we should stop holding up the Nipahat as the ideal home for the Filipino family. The Nipahat may be romantic, it may be picturesque on tourist brochures, but surely the Filipino deserves a stronger, a sturdier, a healthier, a better home. The Nipa hut is easy to build, that is why the people are content with it. But this is the point. The materials for better homes are all around us. The stone, the clay, the wood. It takes a greater effort to gather them or to earn the money with which to buy them. But I say that the Filipino is capable of the effort. Let us glorify the effort and not the Nipa hut. If we are not to glorify poverty, neither should we glorify mediocrity. The Filipino and his nation will be great by his own effort if he is finally liberated from political and economic bonds of his own making in order to be free to strive to excel. Excel in his work, excel in his ambition, excel others, and more important, excel himself. Climbing Everest and even the voice of the Balangay uh, there are there are symbols, symbols that this is what Filipinos can accomplish. You know, uh, fate on the Filipino. We all talk about fate on the Filipino. Uh, Rizal talk about fate on the Filipino. But you have to create an an activity that can stir up the imagination of Filipinos. We have uh, this beautiful community behind me that used to be a slum. So uh, I suppose now we realize that the power to change this country is within the people. No, not just the rich, but the themselves. They are our lost treasure. And they can, uh, we can build the, the, a strong foundation for a first world nation. And this is the essence of freedom and democracy that Raul Manglapos spoke about. We are now in over 2,300 Gawad Kalinga communities. So we can, you know, if we have a transcendent cause, then we can uh, rise above our tribal uh, rivalries you know, and our parochial interests to really be one nation and one people, you know, uh, uh, as envisioned by, by, by Manglapos, who was way ahead of his time. It's, it's very important for us to know people of such a stature in our past, you know, because people always say, where are the leaders? There are so many Filipino leaders, see? except that those who have led us with courage and integrity, we don't remember them. We should remember Raul Manglapos as a true Filipino patriot. Most, most important, I think, you know, his integrity. Because, because this is what is sorely ne needed now, above everything else, integrity. Um, and second is, although he, he was very comfortable, although, like I said, although he was Borghese, he had a, a genuine affection for the lower classes, for the downtrodden, for the oppressed, you know. I could see that that was very genuine. You know, there, there, there are times when I, I would be talking with him and on, on subjects like this, and I, 
sometimes I could feel that his his voice would break, you know, yeah. Mm. Senator Raul Manglapos was a man of uh, ideas whose uh, main book, in fact, was about popular democracy. Uh, that that uh, ideas can be debated, ideas can be uh, proposed. Three things that Raul helped me formulate myself, along with my parents, of course, and the Ateneo and my, and my age. I try to learn from everywhere, but these are the pronounced uh, experiences that I think I must go back to. You have to have vision. Faith in the Filipino, the New Philippines, Bagumbayan. Manglapos represents the best of the Filipino. And that's the reason why we should never forget it. At moments of our history, there, all, there always emerges certain individuals who offer some hope and who are, who are participating in the, in, the political, uh, <clears throat> in the political life of the country, who are offering themselves, and yet they were not t totally accepted when it came to uh, elections to be put in position to translate their uh, visions and their idealism into reality. Secretary Manglapos was the president, the best president we never had. General Almonte was absolutely correct when he said that um, Manglapos is the best president the Philippines never had. It was the, uh, who the made an excellent president. And uh, he was a man of great integrity. He's a God-fearing political leader. And uh, he's a visionary. Like Maxey said, he was very honest. Absolutely honest, you know. But again, like Pilaes, um, it would have been very difficult for him you know, to, to get to be president because I, I knew that he, he wouldn't compromise in, on many issues. Like Pilais, you know, he, Pilais didn't want to compromise also on many issues. And this is when I say they're, they're lousy politicians. N lousy in that sense, huh? that they don't want to kowtow or don't, they don't go, want to go along with the tide. You know? His, his interests ranged across a broad front, nationalism, fiestas for progress, uh, uh, multi-lateral multi, uh, 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 party system, multi-party system, all of those were all, were all, and land reform was born in his mind, uh, all of those, but it's really what binds them together is the fact that this man has been uh, transparent, has been, uh, has had integrity, and he had consistency. More than any single hero, I, politician I know, he was consistent in his beliefs, and he acted on it. There is only one valid revolution left in the world, and that revolution is democracy. At tayo mga kababayan, huwag na nating sabihin na tayo ay tagapag-aral lang ng demokrasya. Tayo ay tagapagturo ng demokrasya. We are no longer students. We are teachers of democracy. Kaya mga, kayo mga kabataan, pagpunta ninyo sa presinto sa Mayo 11, bago ninyo deposito ang inyong balota, tumayo muna kayo ron. Tumindig kayo at harapin ninyo ang buong daigdig. At sabihin ninyo, ako'y Pilipino, magtatayo ko ng isang dakilang republika. I will build a republic second to none because the Filipino is second to none in the world. I am a Filipino, I am a builder, and I am youth. Listen to me because the future is mine. One more thousand years of hope, my world will rearrange. I must rise and dare to cope with blowing winds of change. Once protective.